Hey everyone, diving in with you today on this uh, this whole Apple antitrust lawsuit thing. Yeah. I don't know about you, but it's like everywhere I look, you know, headlines, yeah. articles, social media. It's definitely got people talking. It really has. So yeah. whether you're like me, prepping for some meeting and got to get up to speed yeah. or just super curious about all the drama. It's juicy stuff. We're going to break it all down, untangle this whole legal web and get to the heart of it all, you know. So to set the stage, we've got the U.S. government teamed up with a bunch of states, no less, taking Apple to court, their claim, that Apple is acting like they own the entire playground, especially when it comes to iPhone. Yeah, and it's a pretty compelling case. You know, they kick things off with the scene that feels straight out of a movie, almost. Oh, really? Yeah, we're talking about an email chain from way back when, a top Apple exec freaking out to Steve Jobs himself. Oh, way. Oh, yeah. All because of a Kindle ad, this ad. It dared to show how easy it is to switch from an iPhone to, get this, an Android. Oh, the horror blasphemy. <laughs> and Jobs' response in the email, force developers, make them use Apple's payment system, lock them in. Whoa. Okay, talk about setting the tone. It's like they're saying right off the bat that Apple's not winning fair and square. Yeah. That they're just making it impossible to leave their world. Exactly. Antitrust laws, think of them like the referees in the business world, you know? Okay. They're there to make sure everyone plays by the rules. No one company gets to be so big, so powerful, that it just squashes all the competition and stops new ideas from coming out. And that's a core accusation here. Apple, they're not just selling a product. They've created this whole ecosystem. Right. And the lawsuit claims they're abusing that power to keep people trapped inside. This whole ecosystem thing, it reminds me of Apple back in the day with the iPod. Mm -hmm. You know, the 90s, Apple's practically on life support. Then, bam, the iPod explodes. Suddenly, they're the cool kids again. But here's the thing. The iPod's success, it was partly thanks to an antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft. Ah, uh, the irony. It's wild, right? It is. It is. Microsoft was forced to let iTunes onto Windows PCs which basically threw open the doors to this massive market for Apple. Absolutely. That was a pivotal moment for them. And now here we are. It's fascinating how the tables have turned. Just like Microsoft was accused of trying to squash the competition with Windows, now Apple's facing similar accusations. Huh. History repeating itself? Kinda. In a way, yeah. So the argument is that they're using the App Store's dominance to call all the shots, controlling developers, and ultimately limiting what we as consumers can choose from. So it's like this whole walled garden approach, right? Exactly. And the lawsuit dives into five key examples of Apple allegedly playing dirty. And we're not talking about some obscure technical stuff. This impacts things we use every single day. First up, super apps. Picture this. An app that's like a digital mall, one-stop shop for all kinds of mini programs and services. <laughs> Huge in Asia. But Apple... They basically ban them in the U.S. Now, the really important thing here is understanding why they might do this. Okay, yeah, why? So, these super apps, they make the iPhone itself less essential, right? You don't need to rely as much on Apple's operating system or the App Store. And that threatens their control. And for a company that's being accused of acting like a monopoly, that's a big no-no. So, it's not like these super apps are a bad thing for us, the users. Actually, they sound pretty convenient. It's that they challenge Apple's grip on the whole market. Precisely. This is a tactic called tying. It's like if a coffee shop said, hey, you can only use our specific brand of sugar with our coffee. Ah, I see. You know, they leverage control over one product, in this case the iPhone, to force consumers to use another, Apple's App Store. By blocking super apps, they eliminate competition and potentially shut down these innovative new services that could actually benefit users. So Apple might argue that, you know, they're just curating the App Store for yeah. quality or security or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this lawsuit suggests that it's more about protecting their bottom line, mm -hmm. even if it means holding back innovation. Mm -hmm. And that desire to maintain control. It seems to extend beyond just apps. Yeah. The lawsuit also takes aim at Apple's approach to cloud gaming. Cloud gaming. Yep. We're talking about playing high-end video games on your phone. Even if it's not some top-of-the-line model, it's all thanks to the cloud. Everything runs remotely on these powerful servers. I see. But Apple blocked a lot of those apps, too. Hmm. Why? Well, it's easy to see why, from their perspective, this directly challenges their expensive hardware strategy, right? Think about it. If you can play awesome games on cheaper phones thanks to the cloud, why shell out for the newest iPhone? Okay. I, I get the business logic there. Yeah. But it also feels a bit, I don't know, anti-consumer. Like they're limiting what we can do with the devices we own. 
That's the tension at the heart of antitrust law, really. Mm. Balancing a company's right to innovate and make a profit with the potential harm that can come from unchecked market dominance. Right, right. It's definitely a complex issue. And it's not just about big, flashy features like gaming either. The lawsuit even calls out something that I bet most of us encounter every day. Those green text bubbles. Ah. You know, when you text someone with an Android. The green bubble phenomenon. The lawsuit argues it's not just a design quirk. Wait, really? It is. It's a deliberate strategy. So it's not just me. It always felt like a subtle dig at Android users. Well, the claim is that Apple intentionally makes texting Android users a worse experience to nudge people towards iPhones. Maintaining that ecosystem dominance, even if it means sacrificing seamless communication between users. Wow, that's kind of messed up. It does raise an important question, though. Is it acceptable for a company to intentionally degrade its own user experience? To stifle competition? Something for you to consider as we go deeper. Whoa, okay, that's a heavy one. It definitely makes you think about the trade-offs involved. Okay, exhibit number four, smartwatches. No surprises here, Apple watches only work with iPhones. Buy one, and you're pretty much locked into the Apple universe for phones too. And the lawsuit doesn't start there. It details how Apple allegedly cripples third-party smartwatch features when they're connected to iPhones. Again, controlling the experience, limiting choice. So if I want the full smartwatch experience, I basically have to get an Apple Watch. Whatever happened to letting the best product win? Well, that's the question at the heart of this entire case, isn't it? Is Apple's success truly a result of superior products? Or are they tilting the playing field in their favor? That's a great point. Okay, last but not least, we've got digital wallets. We're talking Apple Pay. And this is where Apple's control over the ecosystem gets even more financially interesting. Oh, how so? Okay, so Apple Pay is pretty much the only tap-to-pay game on iPhones. And get this. They charge banks a fee for every transaction made using Apple Pay. Well, hold on. So it's like they're taking a cut of every coffee I buy using my phone. Yep. Talk about a lucrative business model. But it also feels like another example of them leveraging their dominance in one area, iPhones, to gain an advantage in another digital wallet. Exactly. It's what's known as monopoly leveraging in antitrust law. So we've got super apps, cloud gaming, green bubbles, smartwatches, and now digital wallets. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Absolutely. These five examples are just a taste of what's laid out in the complaint. It's not just about these specific products or services. The lawsuit alleges a pattern of behavior. It's starting to feel like a web, isn't it? With Apple at the center controlling all the threads. That's a great way to put it. And remember, these actions, they don't just impact Apple users, they ripple out across the entire smartphone market. Less competition, fewer choices, less innovation for everyone. This case isn't just about money. It's about who shapes the future of technology and whether we allow one company to hold all the cards. OK, wow, that's a lot to process. It's clear this lawsuit is raising some serious questions about Apple's practices. <laughs> but don't worry, we're just getting started. Stay with us as we continue our deep dive into this complex and fascinating case. So, you know, picking up where we left off, it's really important to remember that this lawsuit isn't about punishing Apple for being successful, right? right? It's about making sure there's a level playing field, protecting both consumers and developers. Yeah, it's like we all love a good underdog story, and Apple was definitely the underdog back in the day. But when the underdog becomes the giant, we need to make sure they're not using that power to you know, stomp out innovation and choice. Exactly. So the lawsuit asks this really crucial question. Is Apple's dominance due to, you know, genuinely amazing products? Or is it because they've built these walls around their garden, making it tough for anything else to grow? Yeah, this whole wall garden thing really struck a chord with me, mm -hmm. especially when the lawsuit took us back to Apple's early days, you know, specifically their journey with the iPod and the, uh, the then dominant Microsoft. It's fascinating how the legal landscape back then kind of shaped Apple's path. It's a great point. So back in the early 2000s, Apple was really struggling to get the iPod off the ground. It wasn't until this major antitrust case against Microsoft forced them to open up their Windows platform that the iPod really took off. So in a way, Apple actually benefited from antitrust action against Microsoft, and now they're facing similar scrutiny. It's almost like a what goes around comes around kind of thing. The parallel is definitely striking. So the lawsuit argues that Microsoft's control over the Windows ecosystem back then stifled innovation and limited consumer choice. And now, the government's claiming Apple is using similar tactics with their iPhone and the App Store. Yeah, it's almost like a cautionary tale about the cyclical nature of power. Mm. You know? 
and the importance of antitrust laws to maintain some kind of balance. Absolutely. And, you know, this historical context, it really helps us understand the broader implications of this case. The tech landscape's always changing, but the principles of fair competition, those remain essential. Right, right. So I've talked about the big picture, the historical context, mm. and those specific examples of Apple's uh, alleged anti-competitive behavior. But what about the impact on, like, the everyday person? What does this all mean for someone who just wants to use their smartphone? That's the crucial question, right? Yeah. So the lawsuit argues that ultimately Apple's actions harm consumers by limiting choices, by driving up prices, and by stifling innovation. When there's less competition, you know, companies have less incentive to push boundaries and create those truly groundbreaking products and services that we all benefit from. It's like, imagine a world where Apple was the only smartphone game in town. Would we have seen the same level of creativity and technological advancements? Hmm. It's hard to say for sure, but this lawsuit definitely raises some valid concern. For sure. And, you know, it's not just about the impact on consumers. The lawsuit also details how Apple's actions can actually harm developers, especially smaller ones. Right. They rely on the App Store to reach their audience. But when Apple controls the platform and dictates the rules, developers have less freedom to innovate and compete fairly. Yeah, it's like a David and Goliath situation almost. Right. With the little guys struggling to get a fair shot. That's a powerful analogy, and it highlights how crucial antitrust laws are, really. They're there to protect competition, to foster a dynamic marketplace where innovation can actually thrive. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. The uh, the dramatic opening of the lawsuit, hmm. the historical context, the potential impact on both consumers and developers. It's clear this is a complex case with far-reaching implications. Hmm. But it's important to remember that, you know, We've only heard one side of the story so far, right? Exactly. So far, this lawsuit presents the government's perspective and yeah. their interpretation of Apple's actions. Apple has denied these allegations, of course, and they will undoubtedly present their own defense, the outcome of this case. Still very much uncertain. But the stakes are undeniably high. It's not just a legal battle, is it? Yep. It's a debate about the future of the tech industry and how we interact with technology in our daily lives. Mm. The decisions made in this case could have you know ripple effects throughout the entire tech world. Well, but before we get ahead of ourselves, there's more to unpack here. Stay with us as we delve into Apple's defense and explore the potential outcomes of this uh, this landmark case. Okay, so we've heard the government side, right? Those five examples they paint a pretty uh, pretty stark picture of Apple's tactics. But as we know, there are always two sides to every story. Right. And in this final part of the lawsuit, we get to hear Apple's defense. And, you know, unsurprisingly, a key part of their argument centers around their commitment to user privacy and security. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, Apple's built their whole brand around being the good guys of tech, right? The ones who really care about our data and keeping our devices safe. But the lawsuit, it seems to poke some holes in that narrative. It does. It does. The government is basically arguing that Apple often uses these claims about privacy and security as like a smokescreen. A smokescreen. Yeah, to hide their true intentions, which they say is, you know, maintaining their monopoly and maximizing those profits. They point to instances where Apple has actually compromised user privacy when it benefited them financially. Oh, really? Like, well, big one that comes up is Apple accepting billions from Google. Billions. Billions, with a B, to be the default search engine on iPhones, despite all the concerns about Google's data collection practices. So it's like they're saying Apple's commitment to privacy is a bit uh, selective, mm. applied when it helps their bottom line, but conveniently ignored when it doesn't. Yeah, pretty much. And it gets worse. The lawsuit even highlights instances where Apple's actions actually make iPhones less secure. Less secure? How? Well, take the lack of encryption in messages between iPhones and Androids, for example. They argue that if Apple truly prioritized security, this is something they would have addressed a long time ago. Hmm. Interesting. So if we're connecting the dots here, the lawsuit is essentially saying that Apple is using privacy and security more as like a shield than as a guiding principle, yeah. choosing to uphold those values only when it aligns with their business interests. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And, you know, it raises a crucial question for all of us listening. Who should be responsible for balancing privacy, security, and competition in the tech world? Should it be left to these companies like Apple to decide? Or do we need, you know, stronger regulations and oversight to make sure there's a fair and innovative marketplace out there? Man, that's a really thought-provoking question. It's like, yeah. we all want our devices to be safe and secure, but we also don't want to live in a digital world that's completely controlled by one company. Yeah, it's definitely a tough balance to strike. It is. 
Okay, so we've covered both sides of the story, the historical context, the potential impact, all of it. But what's the, uh, what's the end game here? What is the government actually asking for? Well, they're not trying to punish Apple for past actions or anything like that. It's more about changing their behavior going forward. So they're asking the court to force Apple to open up their platform, allow alternative app stores, and give developers more freedom to compete. The ultimate goal is to create a more level playing field, you know, where innovation can flourish and consumers have more choices. So it's like they're trying to break down the walls around Apple's garden <laughs> and let a thousand flowers bloom, so to speak. Exactly. And the outcome of this case, it could have a massive ripple effect across the entire tech industry. I mean, if the government succeeds in forcing Apple to change their practices, it could set a precedent for other tech giants who are facing similar scrutiny. So this isn't just about Apple, then. It's about the future of the whole tech landscape. Absolutely. This lawsuit, it's a powerful reminder that even the biggest, most successful companies, they're not above the law and that these antitrust laws are crucial for protecting competition and fostering innovation. Well, there you have it. We've explored the ins and outs of this U.S. government lawsuit against Apple. We've looked at the arguments from both sides, the historical context, the potential impact on the tech world as a whole. It's a complex issue with no easy answers. But hopefully this deep dive has given you the information you need to follow along as this case develops and ultimately to form your own conclusions. As with all things in tech, this story is far from over. But hey, that's what makes it so fascinating, right? Stay curious, stay informed. And until next time, keep diving deep.